Hello, hi everyone. Um, welcome to Cyber Lakes, uh, our quarterly networking event for our cyber community, hosted by Plexel and supported by London uh, Tech London Advocates. So for those of you who don't know me, I'm Diane Gilbert, Plexel's Innovation Ecosystem Lead for London and co-chair of the TLA Cyber Group. Um, Plexel, as many of you will know, deliver a number of innovation programs uh, in partnership with governments, such as NCC for Startups and the Cyber Runway Accelerator. And uh, we now have operations both here in our London Innovation Centre, but also in Cheltenham and Manchester. Um, so it's really great to see you here today um, and so many new faces as well. So welcome again to all of you. Um, so today I'm going to be facilitating a discussion exploring cyber threats at different parts of the food supply chain um, and looking at what the risks and implications of cyber terrorism could be. Um, following the panel discussion there will be time for questions so please do have a think about those and raise them at the end of the session. Um, there'll then be some, a chance for networking and some food and drinks um, from probably about 6.30 onwards. Um, do feel free to post photos or comments on social media um, using the hashtag CyberLates and um, would be really pleased if you would tag Plexel using at Plexel Cyber. Um, the event is being filmed, so if anyone does have an issue with that, just um, please let one of the Plexel team know. Um, but now I'd like to introduce our panelists. Um, so I'd like to welcome Tim Lang, Emeritus Professor of Food Policy at the Centre for Food Policy and also the author of Feeding Britain, Our Food Problems and How to Fix Them. Um, so we're really honoured to have Tim with us as he's one of the leading thinkers on the threats to the UK's food supply chain. So welcome, Tim. Um, I'd also like to welcome Matthew Clark, Cyber Director at insurance firm Partners and to discuss the risk implications of cyber threats for food companies. Um, and on screen, I'd like to welcome Toby Lewis, Head of Threat Analysis at Cyber Unicorn Darktrace, um, who's going to be talking to us about how the company is tackling cyber threats for their food clients. So, welcome all. Um, so, Tim, um, I'd like to come to you first, uh, just to give a bit of scene setting. Um, so, could you just talk to us about in what ways uh, food security is already a concern and just how fragile is our food supply chain? Small questions. Um, don't ask academics big questions like that because you get three hours later I might just have cleared my throat. Um, what are the threats? Well, if you talk to the government, the British government at the moment, they'd say there are no threats at all. It's fine. Look, we proved it. COVID it showed everything well. Well, here was a big, big disruption. No one died from famine on the streets. If you then go and talk to other voices, you will get a very different analysis. Food poverty rocketed, food emergency reliance, box schemes, food banks doubled, uh, disruption occurred, new opportunities for ransomware, the sorts of things you people work on emerged and so on. Uh, and to really answer your question, uh, Britain is a rich country. It's declining, but it's still rich. Um, Money attracts food. Food always follows where the money is. Money is made from food, but food also goes to where the money is. So as a rich country, Britain has great purchasing power. But it's not the only fish in the sea. Uh, the assumption of British food security thinking uh, was set in the 1840s, 1840s, uh, which was... Britain basically made a decision to go for cheaper food and to let its farming go. It was a big fight out between industrialists, financiers, and landowners. And over the next 60 years, basically, food production declined. Food imports increased. The price of food went down, and the argument had been very similar. I'm going to come back to the present, don't worry. I told you I'd do a three-hour version of this. You're getting a short version. Uh, at the end of the 19th century, before the First World War, Britain basically was producing a third of its food. Within a couple of years, it was having to do emergency measures. So what one moment was normal, the next moment was emergency and crisis ridden. We're in that situation now, where something very normal, flows of food, five countries, five companies basically control 75% of food sold to the consumers, five retailers, are the 
the funnel through which all food supply is sucked up from all over the world, but overwhelmingly from the European Union, and gets to people. Now look at exactly what we're in now, Diane. Here we are in a cost of living crisis where suddenly energy is squeezed. Literally yesterday, the Office of National Statistics showed in its latest big survey that the number of people who are um, experiencing food insecurity, as defined by them, has gone to 15% of the population. So, to answer your question, there's not mass starvation in Britain. There are foods coming into the supermarket, so at one level it's all totally normal and going very well. But at another level, the system is creaking. And I haven't even begun to talk about the environmental stresses and strains, the way in which the model of the post-Second World War development of food was about basically using oil. It's an oil-based economy, the food economy. When oil doubled in 2007, the price of oil went to $100 a barrel. Food prices doubled on world markets as well. We're now in that rerun again. We're, we're now in a world where food prices are volatile. The new normal is volatility. So that is partly what I think gets you people, actually gives you market opportunities because there's a lot of uncertainty, a lot of nervousness about long supply chains where interventions and frauds can go on. But the reason I accepted the invitation to come and be with you, because I, I want to hear what you, how you see the world, as you want to hear how I see the world. I see the world, as, the world of food as literally at the world level, it's stressed. That's not me saying that, that's UN bodies, that's all big studies, etc consistently show the food system is overstretched, feeding people in a way that's now turned food for being good for health to being food to actually being bad for health. There are now three times more people obese and overweight than there are starving. That's an extraordinary situation that we've created. So when you ask a little question, you think, oh, well, I'll get Tim to do a, a 30 second answer. I can tell you this is an enormously complicated issue, Diane because it's a complex food system. It's stretched, it's longer chains. There are new sectors emerging overnight. The delivery system, 15 years old. It's making almost as much money as entire farming is in terms of value adding. So loyalties are stretched, needs are stretched, allocation is stretched. So all of that means when there is centralization at certain points, you people become very important because that's where it's very easy to intervene. So I'm someone who says food security, if we now go into the hard stuff, defense, can you take out a food system? Well, I just say one word, Ukraine. You're now seeing what people like me have said, this is the nightmare in food. You literally apply medieval controls over a food system. You blockade people. And that's actually very easy to do with a satellite-based logistics system. That's why I'm interested in you people. What's your role in public food defense, not just corporate food defense? Sometimes they are the same thing, but not always. Thank you. Um, and I think a very wide-ranging and complicated issue. Uh, so th thank you for that, that introduction. I think it'd be really um, interesting to hear from from you, Toby, now, and in, in sort of some of the ways that Dark Trace is, is kind of helping with these security issues. Um, could you just give an, uh, us an idea of what kind of food clients Dark Trace has? No, thank you. And I think when we look at uh, sort of food security, I think broadly speaking, it's the same across many different industries and sectors, whether it's about the automotive industry or, or sort of other sort of manufacturing um, setups where as we sort of heard from Tim there, we've got long supply chains. We've got the idea that there are lots and lots of providers, producers, making stuff, growing stuff, converting raw materials into an end consumer product. And then that, that gets then shipped through supply chains down to the end sort of end user through, through a supermarket. And all of those different layers, all of those different components of that supply chain are, are vulnerable from a cybersecurity perspective. And this is arguably nothing new in, in some respects. They've always been kind of at risk of being targeted or breaking or falling apart. 
But I think what we're seeing increasingly so over the last 10 years is the use of digitization more and more in all parts of the supply chain. Um, we saw as recently as a few months ago where one of the main distributors to SPA in the UK, particularly in the, in the northeast, northwest of the UK, um, they had a major cyber attack and that stopped their ability to distribute food to, to, to local SPA supermarkets. Um, we saw with the JPS uh, meat uh, manufacturer in the US, and again, that brought that all to a ground uh, still as well. Um, and then you think about the digitization that takes place at a production level, about monitoring temperature, about monitoring yield, uh, weights, sunlight, you name it. All of that introduction of technology into our food supply chain presents, on one hand, great economies of scale, um, the ability to really bring efficiencies to our, our process, but at the same time also presents risk. So from a data trace perspective, we've got a number of customers that sit across each of these different sectors, some that are unique to, to the food delivery sector, some that are, are sort of sitting across a number of different industry verticals, but, but certainly food is, is one of those they sit in. And from a dark trace perspective, we've modeled our approach to cybersecurity that instead of hunting for the bad guys, we learn what our customers do. We learn how they operate. We learn how they interact with different parts of their network, how their users connect into their environment. Because one thing that's one thing we've come to understand is that when you have a threat in your environment, whether that's an external threat trying to get in or an internal threat trying to get out, is they don't behave like your normal users would do. They're trying to access systems that you wouldn't expect a normal user to do. And that very tight profile that we can build around normal behavior allows us to detect activity that there is no signature for, there is no rule for, there's no list of bad IP addresses that we can keep constantly referring back to. And so instead, from our perspective, we can lower that threshold when we can start to detect activity that maybe isn't quite malicious yet, but it's certainly suspicious and worthy of looking into. And that means that we can help our customers for whatever part of the food supply chain they're in to be as proactive as possible in investigating cyber threats in their environment. So on that point, I'll, I'll stop and hand you back to, to you, Diane. Thank you. Um, so from your perspective, is this a growing sector or do you find that um, food companies are, are under-investing compared to, to other target markets? Um, and, and it's a good question. I think, you know, we have existed seven, eight years now across, nearly nine years, um, across a whole range of sectors. And we've seen how different organizations, different sectors treat cybersecurity. And fundamentally, cybersecurity for a lot of organizations is a line item, a cost item that they have to try and work out, you know, can they afford it? Can they not afford it? Um, you know, I've worked with some sectors like the finance sector, um, who as long as they it's below a certain percentage of their annual turnover, fine. Um, other sectors, it's something they'd rather not have to think about and not have to do. And arguably the sort of food sector, because it's not traditionally been about technology, I think that's changed a lot over the last 10, 15, and maybe longer. Maybe it's slightly a, a newer sector to the party when it comes to thinking about cybersecurity. But certainly as we've seen over the last sort of few years or so, every pit of that supply chain, because of that use of technology, becomes vulnerable to the impact of a cyber attack. Thank you. Um, okay, sorry. Can I ask you a question, Toby? Uh, of course. For, for my book, I think I found out, or after it, I found out an estimate that food companies were spending some very small amount of money on average. Maybe people here know. So two, three hundred quid. I thought it might be five, ten, twenty, hundred thousand pounds going annually on protecting against cybersecurity. But it was terribly small. Uh, am I wrong in that? You both know that. Um, and, and I said, you've probably got sort of better visibility of some of those those figures that, than I do. I mean, I think rather than the actual raw numbers, I think getting a sense of how do the different sectors compare, how do they sort of consider cybersecurity threats, and generally speaking, those sectors that are high-tech, information-focused sectors, um, so finance, communications, that tends to be where there's a much longer tradition of thinking about cybersecurity, of investing in cybersecurity. Those sectors which are traditionally non-information based, um, predominantly in sort of more manufacturing, heavy manufacturing, that tends to be where you have less investment um, in cybersecurity. And, and I'd argue the food sector has, has for a long time 
been in that latter category. Now, as I said, technology is, is starting to creep more and more into the way in which food is produced. Um, and I said, with that comes that, that heightened risk. So I think it'd be really interesting to hear from Matthew now on, on that point and, and, and how partners and work with um, clients in the food sector. Um, Matthew, what are the in insurance implications for companies that are under investing in cybersecurity, um, but that obviously those attacks then have a result on operations and, and revenue? Yeah, absolutely. <coughs> this, is, this is the question, the question in, in my sector at the moment. We, we exist as a business advisory uh, company, essentially, uh, advising food companies and other verticals on all aspects of their, uh, of their business risk. Um, cyber has rapidly become the main risk element for many of our clients at the moment, and food is, is, is no different to that. The, the in just, just so to, to put some context around this for people, perhaps, cyber insurance exists to, to mitigate the costs of, of a cyber breach, of some sort of cyber assault on an organization. Uh, it's not a silver bullet, it's certainly not a panacea, um, but it, it can take the financial sting out of, out of suffering from a cyber assault. Uh, it, 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 if it's arranged correctly and intelligently, uh, together with um, reasonable self-help steps that the company itself, the policyholder itself is taking towards uh, implementing reasonable cybersecurity steps, and I can talk about that in more detail, uh, then uh, some risk management and some insurance as the ultimate backstop is, 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 is the most effective way that most of our clients have of protecting their life's work, of protecting their businesses. Um, so insurance will, will do three things. It'll, it'll first and foremost act as a, a, as a breach response service. So insurance companies will have breach response teams that swing into action to help the organization to respond once it's suffered a, a, an, a, an attack. Uh, it then deals with any liabilities. So it wraps a blanket of, of a litigation protection, if you like, around the organization, should the breach result in litigation against the organization. And then thirdly, it supports uh, the, the uh, it mitigates the costs that the organization itself incurs in dealing with the breach from IT forensics to public relations consultancy to legal costs uh, that the organization incurs in dealing with the information commissioner or their own regulator. So it does a whole lot of things. Um, but insurance at the moment is quite tough to get. Insurers have come through a period over the last three, four years where they've suffered record losses, and no thanks to ransomware. Ransomware is where it's all at. That's driving the activity at the moment, particularly in the food space. Uh, and insurers have caught a bit of a cold in terms of their underwriting results. This means that um, cyber insurance has become quite a rarefied commodity. Um, policyholders have to take reasonable steps towards getting, implementing uh, uh, basic levels of cyber security. And of course, that differs from company to company. But getting sensible levels of cyber security in place uh, before they're, they're going to enjoy cyber insurance on top. So it, 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 in a way, the, 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 the horrendous level of, of assaults we've seen from ransomware has, has flipped everything on its head. A few, three or four years ago, it was simplicity itself for me to go out and give you a cyber quote, giving you high levels of coverage and very broad uh, spectrum um, uh, protection. Now it's, it's the other way around. Insurers will only insure you if, you're, if you do some self-help work around managing your, your exposures using tools available from um, guys like Toby's firm uh, to, to manage the, the, the risk. I was going to come on to that. Um, in terms of, of how you, you assess you know, how well a company has protected themselves, yeah. are there any um, particular standards or that, that you would draw upon to, to deem that they're acceptable to, yeah. to ensure? Yeah, absolutely. This is a hugely important question um, and one that many food sector clients are asking us at the moment. And I, I think there are five or six key areas that, that insurance companies like to see uh, businesses doing in order to protect themselves. It starts with good corporate governance. So an organization has to have board level buy-in to the importance of cybersecurity, data privacy and, so and network security. So that, that means going beyond simply paying it lip service. This means having um, uh, procedures and policies in place which are reviewed regularly at board level so that there's buy-in to it. Sort of allied to that, the second point is staff training. 
Um, insurers constantly tell us that some 80% of cyber claims they pay out on involve an element of human error. Someone's clicked on something they shouldn't, someone's, someone's been fished, someone's been socially engineered, whatever it is. So it's training your staff within the organization to, to be your first human layer of defense is, is massively important. And in fact, is something that most insurers now, now insist upon. Uh, and the, 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 the third uh, element is um, MFA. Um, so many claims uh, originate, particularly for ransomware, with, with, MFA, with a failure to implement basic security on software accounts. So insurers love MFA, or at least two-factor authentication, if not multi-factor authentication, um, because it's so effective in reducing the attack surface of an organization. Um, allied uh, to that um, is uh, the um, uh, EDR, the, uh, the automatic kind of SOC styled, always on eye in the sky, which is constantly scanning your network and all the relevant endpoints and end users for suspicious activity. As Toby's just said, his company's got some very intelligent, uh, useful tools that do that. Uh, so uh, not necessarily saying you'll rush off and, and buy Toby's immunotherapy for your businesses, but uh, it's, it's something that certainly the, the, the larger the, the organization is, the more likely it is that insurers are going to want to have that kind of um, always-on threat monitoring detection response service. And finally, backup plans. You know, if you do suffer a ransomware assault, it's, it's a lot easier to, be, to get you back on your feet, to reduce the time from the, the impact of the ransomware attack to when you've recovered from it by being able to say, we've got air-gapped immutable backups. Um, so having a proper backup, data backup policy is massively important. Can I ask you, Matthew, and, and, and maybe Toby too, do any of you use PAS 96? I bet you don't. I'm, I'm going to let Toby take that one. <laughs> yeah. Does anyone in the audience, have you heard of PAS 96? Wow. This Can you is elaborate? Okay, <laughs> let me tell you. I think it's is been this worth... in your book, too? But no, it is actually in my book, but don't worry, that's not, that's not why I'm saying it. PAS is the British Standards Institute. When you asked about standards, I thought, he'll say PAS 96. It's, it's called PAS, it's called Food Defence. It's literally written as a set, it's actually eight point steps of what any company should do to protect its supply chains. And some of which is what you said, but more it does more than that. It was written first in 2014, and it was then updated in 2017. And if you put food defense into the British government's websites, it takes you to PAS 96 and says, do this. And for me, that's not the answer. I think I just wondered whether any of you use that. Is that a, 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 an industry-wide? I see lots of people going onto their phones and looking to see what is it. I assure you it exists. I literally was looking at it yesterday. Um, well, I mean, you raise a good point because accreditations. That's what I thought you were going to get at. I yeah. thought if it's accredited, by whom, to what standard? It's, it's not, it doesn't tend to be um, a requirement of insurance, although it, it can sometimes be. Right. But Cyber Essentials or Cyber Essentials Plus, or some of the ICO uh, standards, right. are often uh, expected of certain organizations, given their size Toby's and what they're doing. So that's something that insurers would, would, would like to have in place. And of course, in obtaining those kinds of accreditations, you've often gone through some of the hoops I mentioned earlier, like staff training, for yes, example. Yes. Yeah, well, um, well, if nothing else, I think it's been worth asking me. I've learned uh, something. Uh, yeah, go and have a look at PES 96, because it's, I think it's very interesting. But I think it's also very limited in terms of what Diane asked me. Um, I mean, Toby, I'm sure you, you'd know this. You can look at an individual product supply chains or a particular company, the total range of their products, and look at their supply chains. Um, and that's not the same thing as national food security, which is what Diane was asking you about. Then you're into well beyond individual companies or products. You're talking about border controls. You're talking about is anyone protecting us for uh, lots of you know, grand scale stuff. Um, and you're also talking about moral questions about what's the point of land? Do you have land to just look after wildlife? 
or do you have land to look after wildlife and produce food to feed people? So if you're not going to use your land as a country to feed people, it means you're going to be using other people's land. So you're into the big macro politics, which we're seeing raised by Ukraine now. That's why Ukraine is so important, bringing people like me together with people like you, because suddenly 50 countries are fed by Ukraine. 50 countries are fed by Ukraine. And food prices have rocketed and are going wobbly. Uh, and suddenly an entire complicated set of networks which Toby at Dark Trace, you will monitor some little bits of that, but as a huge picture, what people like me use a phrase, the food system, mm -hmm. this is why we use it, because it's not just companies, it's a whole web of interconnections uh, that go not just com internal in company or company to company, they go company right the way through different sectors. And that's what PAS 96 does not get. It, and I do write about that in my book. I criticise it, say, this is not the sum of what we need to be thinking about now. But I think you'd all find PAS 96 really interesting. And I bet you'd write it better, actually. Um, thank you for that tip. And I think I'd like to come back to some of those kind of wider um, points, uh, sort of political points um, in a moment. But before that, um, sort of to go back to, to the, the products and how they can help, um, Toby, it would be interesting to hear from your perspective what the biggest threats specifically to food companies are and, and how you, you're kind of tailoring your um, underlying solutions or products to, to solve them. No, thank you. And, and, and it was really interesting to kind of hear some of the comments that, that Matthew had in terms from a sort of a cyber insurance perspective. And I remember working with cyber insurance many, many years ago when it was really in its kind of, um, kind of immature sort of stages. And, and you're absolutely right. Um, I think at one point, anybody could get cyber insurance and you could just ring up an insurance company and go oh, yeah we'll, we'll offer you a premium and for some organizations that was how they dealt with the cyber problem they just bought insurance and, and hoped it would be fine and and i think very much like with car insurance you can't get car insurance unless you have an mot you know it's a, a very basic standard of the, the roadworthiness of your vehicle and the same is arguably true for for any organization and, and we heard some some references there to cyber essentials cyber essentials plus and, and a few others as well which which are beginning to become they're not quite there yet but beginning to become kind of the de facto standards to go for from from a cyber security perspective um, i mean to go to your question i mean you mentioned about about threats and for a lot of the uh, the food sector in mean, any manufacturing sector anything with long supply chains disruption is by and large the biggest threat not from a necessarily a technical perspective, but just disruption. Food gets delayed in a warehouse, um, it gets rerouted in a different direction, food spoils, it gets lost, I mean, you, you name it. Disruption is, is the biggest threat, so I'd argue most, most sort of manufacturing sector in the food sector is no different than that. Um, when it comes from a cyber perspective, the overwhelming threat that generates disruption is ransomware. And we've seen from sort of 2017 when we saw WannaCry kind of rear its head, um, and ever kind of since then, ransomware has been the topic that, that cybersecurity folks like myself talk about at any great sort of stage. And I think the challenge that, that many people face, many organizations face, is when they think about ransomware, they go back to 2017. They think about WannaCry. They think about this piece of ransomware that just somehow gets on a computer network and then spreads virally, completely automated, completely you know, uncontrollably spreads virally through a network. And whilst those threats still broadly exist, the vast majority of the high impact ransomware incidents that we see, and you know, I made reference earlier to, to JBS, the meat processing in the US, there was a distributor in the northeast of England for, for SPAR. Um, in both those cases, there were ransomware incidents that took place. But these weren't ransomware incidents that were just spread virally on their network because they connected at the wrong time. At some point, there was a threat actor, a cyber criminal, who gained access to their environment. Um, either because they, they hadn't performed some due diligence around patching software, things that face the internet and not updating and not patching it, or the most common trait we come across is a stolen credential, a stolen password. Now, either they sent them an email to, to fish that or they found it somewhere else, and then they gained access to the network. And then from there, they used those stolen credentials to move inside the network as if they were a legitimate user. And I think why that approach, that tradecraft, is, is worrying is that you know when I look across the cybersecurity section, I've been doing cybersecurity now for nearly 20 years, 
And when I look across the sector, so a lot of it is based on the idea about building up lists of bad, bad IP addresses, bad domains. Um, and if an attacker is coming into your network from one of these bad IP addresses, fine, you can block it. What if they're not coming from one of those lists of bad IP addresses? How do you know about it? Um, and I think specifically then when we start to recognize that one of the big trade crafts we see from ransomware groups is using stolen credentials. They are literally just using the username and password of your legitimate users. And so when you have a log on event, if you're a system administrator and somebody logs onto your network and they move laterally, they try and connect to a different part of your, your network estate, they're using the right username and password. So how do you know if they're the real person behind the keyboard? And we heard from Matthew talking about MFA, multi-factor authentication. Absolutely, it's a brilliant game changer when it comes to so many of these types of attacks. They can still be defeated in a sort of a very small Venn diagram overlap of cases. So I wouldn't want to say that it's a silver bullet and that's all you need. And that's why from a dark trace perspective, we look at behavior. We look at understanding how users interact with devices, interact with services, when they log on, what sort of time of day, what sort of infrastructure they're using, uh, where do they go once they're inside? Because if someone's stolen a username and password, the chances that they are able to mimic 100% of that person's identity they fundamentally just stolen, and yet still achieve some ransomware at the end of it is, well, slim to none. So at some point, they're gonna have to deviate from normal behavior. And from a dark trace perspective, that's where we catch them. They've not downloaded malware to the environment. They've not come in from a bad IP address. They're just behaving differently. And that is, for us at Darktrace, enough to detect that sort of activity. And, and for the most common tradecraft we see, it's, it's amazing at stopping ransomware. I, can, I, can I just come in on some of that? Because that's really relevant stuff to the insurance world. We, Lloyds of London, uh, which is a big provider of cyber insurance, put out some, some figures recently that uh, did a deep dive on all of their cyber claims statistics. And cyber, ransomware was, uh, I think this was two years ago, was accounting then for about 20% of the uh, total uh, type of, of cyber claims that they were paying out for, but it was over 80% of the cost. So in terms of the financial severity of a ransomware attack, it's way ahead of any other types of, of, of cyber assault. And uh, I, th I think this, this whole ransomware as a service um, uh, predilection that, that um, the dark web uh, cyber criminals seem to have at the moment, y you were just saying, uh, Tim, that it's targeted attacks increasingly, and that's very true. You know, uh, JBS was, was one such attack which Toby mentioned. There was a, another interesting one in, in Australia, the, the Lion Brewery Company, which I'm sure Australians would see as critical national infrastructure. Um, and g at one point, I understand that they're, that, 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 that they're such a big producer that, 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 the, that it looked like that there was a chance of beer production being shut down in, in Australia for several, several weeks, which must have absolutely terrified them. But, but the point is that the, these, these sorts of attacks are increasingly sophisticated, increasingly targeted, massively expensive, uh, and leads to, to my point, from, from the insurance standpoint, it's not so much about disruption, that's a given, it's more about reputational injury. So the reputational damage that, that, that policyholders suffer not just the people who've suffered a loss, but have perhaps suffered a loss because of their supply chain dependency. The suppliers suffered the loss and they've actually themselves been interrupted in terms of their own operations as a, as a result of that, which is something you can now ensure, by the way. Um, that, that is, is it, it, the first thing it gives rise to is, is reputational injury. So insurers will wrap around the policy some additional benefits, things like um, access to the insurer's dedicated a public relations company to help manage the communications with customers and third parties in the press if there's been a, a, a cyber attack a hugely important because reputational damage is is, is the one thing that's a, a common feature and Matthew, do you I mean just to sort of, sorry I'm just going to sort of jump on that in terms of that reputational side of things uh, I mean absolutely and I you know I've worked with many organizations who've suffered a ransomware attack and and actually it's the reputational aspect that for them is, is really quite critical and whether it's about, you know, I remember Travelex when they got hit with ransomware, it was New Year's Eve 2019, just before this thing called COVID really reared its head uh, for us here in the UK. And their share price dropped 20, 25% over the course of that first week of just having a ransomware issue itself. And then I've worked with other organizations. And in fact, I remember um, was it recently about a week ago, two weeks ago, um, the, one, of the, one of the identity providers called Okta, um, they were hit, well, they were 
they were compromised as a result of a supply chain issue, not ransom, but because of the way they handled the incident, they were slated in the press. They were sort of accused of not handling it properly, of not disclosing information properly. And so just by having an incident and how you manage it and how you talk about it can have a real reputational impact in terms of how others see you, whether they tr uh, see you as trustworthy. Now, okay, maybe trustworthiness is, is maybe less of a concern in the food industry as it is than the cybersecurity industry, which is where Okta um, fall into. But yeah, reputation is, is really key. I was just going to ask, do you find by and large that the food companies you work with are, are more exposed to cyber risk than the non-food companies? Yeah, well, I mean, we, <coughs> we work, in addition to food and drink, we, we work with um, a broad range of, of industry verticals from construction to real estate to science and technology uh, to financial services. I would say financial services still probably carries um, the most risk and uh, receives the most attention from cyber criminals. But food is, 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 is catching up. Um, you know, as Toby said earlier, a greater reliance upon uh, new technologies, uh, uh, new um, third party suppliers, um, the adoption of sort of digital digitization within organizations, which has been accelerated by COVID. All of these are, are super convenient because they en enable you to um, do things remotely and um, you know, uh, get monitor, more closely monitor production processes and temperatures, pressures, water usage, wastage, all that kind of stuff, which is very important. But they increase your ta attack surface at the same time. There's, they, they, they are rich pickings for cyber criminals, particularly ransomware criminals, who are constantly looking for, uh, in particular, kind of SCADA, based process systems which they can attack remotely or via a third party um, managed service provider um, and take control of individual bits of, of equipment and so on. In fact, it leads to one important thing which is a, uh, for in the insurance space is a bit of a sort of elephant in the room which is how long is it gonna be before there's human bodily injury as a result of a cyber event in the food space and how is that gonna be handled? Um, there are, there's a debate between cyber insurers and product liability insurers as to who should pick that up, but that's absolutely something I would want to be protected from, for if I, from a liability perspective, if I was a food manufacturer. Thank you. The, the, this is a great question, actually. The, there's, a, there's been a debate for the last couple of years in insurance over the extent of cyber coverage in traditional insurance policies. So things like product liability policies have been in place for a long time for food producers, food manufacturers, and they are designed to, to uh, pr provide protection from liability, from litigation, if um, somebody is, is ill or injured from uh, the consumption of the product that's being produced, okay? So that, that has tended, we've tended to think of that traditionally in terms of contamination of some sort during the manufacturing process or in the supply chain that's not picked up before at the final stage when the, when the product gets shipped. And that's why um, we uh, have traditionally always looked at selling product liability along with uh, uh, something called recall insurance and contamination insurance, which provides that protection for that client. Now, that's, that's always been based upon the negligence of the policyholder in the manufacture of that product. So if there's a cyber event, is that still going to kick in and pay for them? So there's been a big debate as to whether or not a product liability insurer who's become accustomed for, for, for decades insuring um, negligent contamination of products suddenly has to now think of cyber risk, someone hacking your poultry processing facility and, and, and taking control of data and manipulating quality reports and all of that uh, so that you're pumping out off-spec off food, essentially. Now, the cyber insur insurance market has matured rapidly in recent years, so th there are some, er some cyber insurers who will pick up that bodily injury risk now for certain types of industry, um, but for things like food, those cyber insurers are still looking at the product liability insurer to say, you pick that up. And they have been encouraged by Lloyds of London, in particular in recent years, to issue what are called silent cyber riders on their policies. Which, which make it clear that they're not looking to pick up cyber-related losses. So it creates this conundrum for policyholders, you know, which policy is going to pick this up, which is why getting advice from 
from an independent uh, expert insurance broker is is a forget the pu plug is a, is a good is a good way to go so we can make sure that you've got the right protection in place well you would say it, it, it almost doesn't matter who's liable in the end as soon as you face that legal allegation you've got to legally defend yourself from it so you've got legal you've got legal defense costs you've got compensation awards being thrown at you You've got um, hysterical legal costs from the other side that are being levied. You want a policy that's going to pick up all of that and defend you right up until the point where there's a, a, f a finding at court. Yeah. Well, I, I, I think this is why insurance can be so powerful, because um, otherwise you think of the organization having to self-fund that kind of event. If you're a massive multinational, that's probably okay. But if you're an SME, that's not okay. If you've got hundreds of thousands of pounds worth of legal defense costs to find, that's your margin wiped out for that year, perhaps. This is where my interest cut in, into yours. Um, I'm interested in the systemic difficulties. You tend to be interested, and your question is about corporate or one supply chain or one product line. What I'm interested in is what's the preparation for multiple breakdowns? At the moment, we've got experience now of, you know, people like me, my antenna waved over SPA and JBS and everything. But they were containable, you could argue, yeah. with difficulty but containable. But what if you had multiple? Now, we've, we had that in the 1980s. This is pre-cyber. We had that over food fraud and adulteration and contamination. We had it in blood supplies, actually, in medicine, yeah. but we also had it in food with mad cow disease and then with the, um, the meat scandals, where even Tesco, mighty Tesco, then the third largest food retailer on the planet, yeah. did not know it was selling pies, which contained horse and all sorts of other yeah. crap. And there's a okay. the whole organics thing as well. Correct. All of that starts going away from one company or one product line into something more systemic. And that's why people like me are interested in the role of the state because this goes beyond. When, if you, I'm sufficiently old, went through the mad cow uh, problems and the food poisoning scandals of the 19, late 1970s and 1980s, and it hit the fan in the early 1990s, when big company after big company said, we can't contain this, we need new laws, new systems. Now, I'm saying, well, what I'm interested with this audience, Diane, and people like Toby and Matthew, uh, is are you thinking ahead of that? You're seeing the difficulty for Lloyds, but what if you look at a national level, or what if you look at a European level? Um, and that's where I get a bit nervous, because I think Britain's done some very extraordinary things. It's now no longer talking to other countries. It's, uh, and that, I think, for food, is very, very risky indeed, particularly when, as I say again, uh, depends which government figures you use, but we're either importing 46% of our food or 30 to 40% of our food, or if you do ecological accounting, we're actually importing 70% of our food because we're using other people's land to grow inputs into food. So the degree of risk, Toby and you, Matthew, um, you're, you're rightly using risk assessment stuff one of the reasons I said I thought you, might, you people might be interested in PAS 96 is because it says everyone should use TACCP. Now, in, for me, in food safety, HACCP, do you know HACCP? You'll all know HACCP, developed by NASA to stop basically astronauts getting the shits. You know, th th that's what it became. Literally, you don't want to send people to the moon and go round or go and live on a planet Zog and get diarrhea. It's not good in an astronaut suit. So immense, the RAND Corporation, no less, uh, was put onto the case for NASA, came up with this approach. We'll investigate where the weakest links are. It's kind of what you, you, you taught us. And, and, and PAS, BS, the BSI says, and others say, well, what we have to do is develop a TAC, a threat assessment critical control point. And that's basically what you, you are doing and you're talking. But that is not systemic threat critical control point. And that's what I'm interested in. And which, which bits of the state do
do deal with. Is there bits of the UN they deal with? Because uh, they're interested in this. Let me tell you, the World Bank is interested in this. Um, it's the, unless we're retreating, as some some theoreticians argue, we're going. Globalization era two is over, and there's a retreat to more shorter supply chains, less taking things from the other side of the world, making it easier to control, to control and contain, and to keep on your observation better. All of that is coming into the food system. So I'm interested in whether you're aware of that, because I think in the next five to 10 years, that's gonna be very hot indeed. And you people won't be dealing with products and companies, you'll be dealing with countries. And I say one word again, Ukraine, because we've seen that in that. That's the big issue from Ukraine. Thank you, Tim. Um, and so we will go to the, the audience for questions very shortly, but this kind of ties back nicely to the, the, the more overarching question that um, I touched on earlier. So um, given, given all that sort of relatively uh, bleak outlook, like what, what do we need to do from... <laughs> What, 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 in your opinion, do we need to do from a policy and ecosystem and innovation point of view to protect our food chain from cyber threats? Well, I think, uh, for, for my, from my point of view first, you know, uh, the government, it, it, there's a lag, but it's catching up. Yeah. Um, the the, uh, the GDPR-related um, law, which I'm sure you've all heard of, is now enshrined in, in um, our current data protection legislation. Uh, President Biden signed the Critical Infrastructure Act um, just recently, I think, which has extended the, the burden of cybersecurity and in, in relation to how bus businesses and organizations respond to having a cyber event. Uh, uh, it's broadened that to encompass uh, food and agriculture. Um, so there are now increasing regulatory burdens and impositions on businesses. There's similar legislation in the UK being considered in relation to managed service providers upon whom hundreds or thousands of companies may rely. So anything where there's a critical potential point of failure is gonna come under scrutiny from central government. And that's, that's a good thing. I hope they extend that to, to demanding mandatory insurance, which would be great. Um, but but it, it, crucially, a lot of the work that we do as risk advisors and insurance professionals is to educate clients and inform clients of the risk, uh, uh, cyber risk, uh, how it impacts their sector, how it impacts their business. There are more tools from people like Darktrace that enable us to do that, and then helping them to manage it um, before you even talk about insurance. Manage and reduce your risk before you, you and then ensure the residual risk. So uh, it's an education process that's still in play. It's gonna take a bit longer before it's ubiquitous and has broader appeal, but we're determined to make sure that our clients are informed and understand the risks. Toby, Tim, do you have a view? Yeah, I do. Um, and I think from, from my perspective, you know, we, you can almost look at this in, in a few different ways. Um, you know, if you're looking at those much more strategic national level type concerns, uh, and then you've got to start thinking about where does where does the government come in on this? And I think you've got the National Cyber Security Centre, which uh, I can speak to a degree because that's where I spent a lot of my, my early career uh, within GCHQ and NCSC, building and understanding how to do incident management of large national incidents. Um, but then you've also got the, the role of DEFRA in all of this. And again, they're increasingly making, you know, there's, a, there's a cyber team at DEFRA that's, that's worth sort of recognising, um, considering the fact that food itself is a determined a Christian or piece of national infrastructure when it comes to how we defend it. Um, and I think from, from those organisations, you've got a combination of, uh, from a cybersecurity perspective, activities that can be done at a national level in terms of things like the NCSC's Active Cyber Defence Programme, for example, in terms of providing a strategic um, uh, defences um, from when it comes to cybersecurity. Um, and then the, the, the aspects that are much more specific to the food sector uh, and that's where we come down to, to DEFRA. Now, I, I'm sure Tim will, 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 will tell me that, that the DEFRA aren't doing a good job there. That's not my area of expertise, so I can't comment on it. Um, but certainly at a, at a cyber level, and if we're looking at those much more national level type things, I think, I think the work the NCSE has done since it was founded, uh, again, I'm somewhat biased, um, is, is pretty good. Yeah, I agree with that, actually. Um, I, 
I think one thing that we haven't been talked about and certainly follows from my sort of analysis is we need um, not just the below the radar work that we're talking about, the Joint Intelligence Committee, I hope, is doing work on this, um, the National Cybersecurity Center. I, I argued in my book, Toby, that uh, much more attention to this needs to be given by the National Infrastructure Commission, which is the one bit of the British state which is charged with a 50-year horizon, and there isn't much. And let me tell you, the ecosystems risks, we've been talking about risks to food, whoa, the ecosystems risks are immense. And they outweigh what individual terrorists can do. They don't outweigh what the Russians could do or the Chinese could do or Indians could do if they declared war on us or whatever. Uh, but we have to have some democratic accountability. You know, you were rightly, you two were rightly talking about what can companies do and how can they develop internal cultures and training and skills. Tick, 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 I agree. But we've got to do that at a national level, actually. There's no thinking about this across uh, House of Commons select committees. Let me just tell you that. There's none. Uh, the Intelligence Committee, I hope, is doing it, but we're not privy. <laughs> it doesn't publish its records, so we don't know. Uh, and ultimately, I don't know whether you would agree, you probably don't, uh, but ultimately, I think this has to be taken to the public. The public have to be brought on board to not colluding in their own downfall. So I would want more democratic accountability, more open discussion of this, more awareness of the risks, more awareness of how, uh, you know, I think data protection and handing over passwords and all the multiple password systems that you were rightly saying, Matthew, come in, are very good. But they don't get that state role, this is where the role of the state becomes very important. It creates level playing fields, it creates frameworks, it creates learning opportunities across sectors. And I don't see that yet, Diana, and that's what I, I would like to see more of. Why? I'm a public health man, actually, I should have said that. The point of the food system is to feed people, actually, and to provide long-term health and public good. Uh, and we're now very clear in science of what we want from the food system. We want it to be good for the environment, to protect the environment, not destroy it. And actually the food system, you probably don't realize this, is the biggest cause of environmental damage on the planet. It's the biggest user of water, the biggest destroyer of biodiversity, it's the bigger, dis biggest destroyer of land use. This is bad news, I'm sorry, I am. I do agree, this is very bad news. But it can also be the reverse. It can be actually very good for the environment. It can be looking after and cleaning water. It can be protecting seas. And we're not doing that at the moment. And that, I spent four years the policy lead on a huge international commission called the Eat Lancet Commission, trying to say, is it possible to feed nine billion people healthily without destroying the environment by 2050? I thought our answer would be no. Actually, our answer was yes, it is possible to do it. But it's not to do what we're doing at the moment, to carry on churning out ultra-processed foods, to see more and more meat consumption as a good thing because that's the biggest user of land and also the biggest user of wars and things. So you've got a different version, if I may say, of security. So when Diane asked me at the beginning, and I said, look, I'll do a three-hour version of it, and I only did it in four minutes or something, um, this is what we talk about. We talk about the way in which how we're eating is actually a cause of threat to our own long-term food security. And that's a very interesting point because there's a clash of cultures going on within the policymakers. Policymakers get it now but don't know what to do about it. And in the end, it's got to be about engaging with the public. And I see the same in cybersecurity. We need the dark traces and all you clever people doing wonky, geeky stuff and really analysing it. But in the end, it becomes about people. And we're not thinking enough ahead about how to engage people in societal food cyber security. And that's the challenge I now throw out. That's why I wanted to come and hear what you people think. I want to know what's your take on societal food defence Use my phrase, food defense. That's what it becomes, let me tell you. And in hard terms, in wars, in conflicts, in major disruptions, wow, you need food defense. 
and I don't think we've got national food defence. It's my assessment. And you can read 30 pages where I summarise that in my book. And then write to me. Thank you, Tim. On, on that point, um, it'd be really good to uh, hear some questions from the audience, if there are any. Um, if you could put your hand up, we'll come to you with a microphone. There's a microphone just coming for you. Oh, hi, my name is Zish. Uh, I'm a lawyer at Clyde & Co. Um, in your last dialogue, you mentioned uh, long supply chains and the disruption they're facing and the connotations you suggested were rather negative. So I'm quite curious as to, uh, as to what all, all three of you, what all three of you, like, what's your opinion on long supply chains and short supply chains generally? Do you think, which one do you think is better? Um, considering the, the sheer depth of experience all three of you have, what do you think are some of the improvements we've seen in supply chains over the last decade, uh, particularly in light of disruptions we've seen with COVID and of course the shipping crisis that happened with the, um, the Evergrande and the Suez Canal uh, not so long ago. So just your thoughts on this, please. Thank you. I, I can uh, start with that, if that's okay. Um, Clyde & Co actually are a, a, an excellent uh, breach response council and partner for some of the insurers that we work with. Um, it's an interesting question, and um, uh, let me answer, answer it this way. If, so, if somebody were to come to me and ask me to insure a fireworks factory, um, if it's really well risk managed, I'd be happy to insure it at the right price. So let's, let's layer that over your question. If it's, if it's a long and complex supply chain as opposed to a short and simple one, I would much rather ensure the consequences of a problem with a long and complex supply chain that's really, really well risk managed and understood as opposed to a short supply chain that hasn't had any risk management thinking applied to it. Uh, it's, it's all about risk management. It's about understanding the threats to, to a supply chain um, that are posed to the organizations that are relying upon it as much as to um, the, 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 the originators of it themselves, if I can put it that way. Uh, and it's, it's about getting to grips with the day-to-day -day exposures that, that that supply chain has and being, having a plan, being prepared for the business continuity challenges should that supply chain be interrupted. If that's all been thoroughly thought through and there are good plans in place, good to go. I, I agree with that. I don't know what Toby thinks. I'll add one cross-cutting point, which is, and this I write out at length in my book, which is, I think, a long... Uh, long versus short debate, which is quite right, and I agree with Matthew's an analysis. There is actually, I think, the l even more important one, uh, which is centralised versus decentralised. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to come in because I'm interested in what Toby thinks about that. Um, I think there is a case in socially responsible food defence to argue for more decentralization and less centralization because centralization is easier to disrupt than decentralized. And I'll freely admit it, Diane, I haven't thought it through, but I've talked with a heck of a lot of people who are beginning to think that's the case. Uh, and I will take you to one study, Toby, maybe you know it, done in 2004, asked for by the Ministry of Defence from Cranfield when it was also running the military intelligence bit. Uh, and I talked with them about this. And it basically said, look, if terrorists come in and um, attack, didn't say Tes Tesco or Sainsbury or whoever, you know, they, the, the big retailers each have 14, 15 regional distribution centres, RDCs. Okay, if two of them are taken out, it doesn't matter, there are others, they can adapt. And actually, that's the right logic, but it's then not followed through when it comes to the centralization of corporate cybersecurity. And it seems to me that's, I want to know why. You're, you're looking like you're thinking. Toby, what do you think? You can give no, us the NSC. And I, think, I mean, and supply chain security is, is an interesting challenge in its own right. I don't think it's necessarily uniquely tied to cybersecurity. Cybersecurity is just one risks that, are, uh, that, that can affect supply chains. Certainly when we work with organizations, there is a combination of, I suppose, understanding the, uh, where are the choke points, where are the delicate parts of that supply chain, where could they fall over, where could they break, where could one organization 
become compromised and suddenly you lose that flow of whatever product it is. And so in a lot of cases, the approach when it comes to supply chains, long, short, in the middle, is about a diversity of supply chain, is about resiliency of supply chain. So you know, if you have got lots and lots of different suppliers, if one of those suddenly disappears from your network, are you able to just switch to a second one, for, for example, and, and maybe get some sort of services from them? I, I mean, in terms of you know, Tim's points around centralization and decentralization, um, I, I think you're right to a greater or lesser extent in that by putting all of your literal eggs into one basket, if that basket breaks, you then, you then got nothing. You then got no other sort of distribution at all. And for, for SMEs, that's really hard to do because how do you decentralize when you only got one depot anywhere? Um, so there are challenges to that depending on the size of the organization. Um, but certainly I think if we, when we talk about supply chain security, one of the big things in there is just about diversity of supply chain. So that if one area breaks, you, you've got something to fall over to. Thank you. Um, and I have realized we've gone over time um, quite significantly. So testament to how interesting the conversation is. But I think if we take one more quick question. When you talk about diversification of the supply chain, I mean, surely that makes it less secure, isn't it? I mean, you can't have give loads of different vendors access to your system um, and then expect that to be the, like, not to have any issues from that, surely. Uh, and I suppose when we're talking about suppliers and we're talking about connectivity, what does that actually mean in practice? You know, if we're talking about, yes, they are directly connected into your computer network and they can access your email system, then yes, I, I completely agree with you. We start talking there about uh, third party access to systems, how do you govern those, how do you protect those? And there are technical means for understanding that. And from a dark trace perspective, we can, you know, whether it's users or third party users, it doesn't make a difference. We can still profile and understand them. I think when we talk about supply chain diversity, I think of it not in exclusively in a cyberspace context, but in terms of, you know, if you know, if you need a supply of cheese, I'm going, to, I'm going to pick the food analogy for a little bit, making sure that if one supplier runs out of cheese, you can go and buy it from somebody else. I mean, we're talking at a much more gen general level when it comes to diversification, rather than at a pure network cybersecurity perspective. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and there will be an opportunity to, to continue the conversation um, in Plexel Park uh, with the, the promised food and drinks that are now waiting for you. Um, but ahead of that, I'd just like to say thank you so much to our panellists for um, a really uh, thoughtful and insightful conversation. Um, and uh, I guess, actually, I'd just like to ask one more quick question. Um, very succinct answer, please, uh, Tim. Is there... Um, any signs of optimism, any, uh, any reason that you can share that we can be optimistic? Yeah, I'm very optimistic about food security because I think we're having discussions like this and we're having massive international discussions about food security and there's a beginning of realization that you know, climate change is a risk in the same way that cyber security is a risk and some of the learnings from different parts can be applied to other parts. But what there isn't adequately I have to be sober, I'm sorry, Diane, um, is the coordination of it. That's the failure. And usually that is where things go wrong. Lack of coordination, lack of coherence um, enables randomness to occur. Thank you. But um, I'm an optimistic person <laughs> by nature, so you can ignore everything I've said. <laughs> that was because I was a breech baby. In other words, I came out backwards. <laughs> So I always say to my students, I'm an optimist despite the evidence. <laughs> well, thank you, Toby. Thank you, Matthew. And thank you, Tim. And um, let's go and carry on the conversation. Thank you, Toby. Thank you.